So these five friends, as well as um, Jim Foley's mother, Diane, um, knew Jim through different places and vocations in his life. Yago Kura, uh, Sajal Shaw, and Aaron White were fellow students in the, um, in the years Jim studied here. Yago was a poet who put together the lovely hustles for Foley. Sajal writes poems, fiction, and essays. Like Jim, Aaron turned to nonfiction after writing fiction in her years here. Daniel Johnson knew Jim uh, through the Teach for America program and is currently working on a book of poems about Jim. Tom Durkin is a friend from Marquette days. So as we know, it's a writer's job to see what is invisible to others. Um, teacher's job, photographer's job, poet's job. And it seems to me we're here to see more and to see more precisely, to not turn away. And there are many instances in Jim's work as a fiction writer when he was here of him not turning away. Um, out of a desire to keep seeing what Jim saw and what he is not here to see, the faculty and alumni of the MFA program, with the generous blessing of the Foley family, are establishing a prize in his name. Beginning in the spring of 2017, the prize will be awarded annually to a current MFA candidate on the basis of a sample of prose in the form of an honorarium. The James W. Foley University of Massachusetts Memorial Prize is meant to remind us of Jim's candor, his resilience, his gift of sympathy. The prize is designed to support the work of writers who express a political awareness and sensitivity in their prose and whose concerns extend beyond the limits of their particular circumstances and home language. By the example of his teaching and written work, Jim encouraged us to care for those he cared for. He invited us to be bound by a shared desire to matter to others. The James W. Foley Prize is an expression of a collective commitment to pay tribute to Jim's work to assure that the stories he left behind continue in conversation with stories yet to be written. Please, if you're able to help us spread the word about the prize, um, to make a contribution to it, there are um, cards outside that give you the Minute Fun site, the website to which you can, can uh, where you can find us. And we'll begin with Daniel Johnson here, and we'll hear that continuation of the conversation among these, these uh, people gathered. Thank you. Puzzle for James Wright Foley. Kinetic friend, you moved like light in a mirrored room. Come home. Raqqa, Damascus, Aleppo, Holmes. You rarely took a room. Come home. We'll read Borges aloud, burn windfall in the pit, spark a joint, you'd leave a parting gift, a rebel scarf or Turkish cartoon, come home. You crashed your Civic, reading Chomsky in Chicago traffic. Who now will shatter the day into such bright ruins, come home. I killed a bat in Olana's room, its body the size of a grape. I laid it in the trash on eggshells like broken stones. Come home. Ruthke, in his journals, wrote, the cage is open, you may go. If sunlight, if sunlight bleeds under your cell door, Jim, never the moon, come home. So that's uh, included in puzzles for fully uh, collected by uh, Iago, a dear friend of uh, Jim's and mine. Um, I met James Foley through Teach for America when we were teaching in Phoenix, uh, I called him Jimmy. And I'm working on a book of poems, um, which I really consider to be uh, love poems uh, for my friend. And um, <coughs> during our time uh, together, we made a pact to become writers. And uh, here's a picture, actually, uh, right after Do You See the You Master. Uh, I think that somehow the gods must have arranged at the UMass, um, the fiction team. They won the intramural championship. Like, when, when does that happen? Jim was <laughs> on that team. And, um, you know, so much of our friendship was built around writing. We, we swapped books. We shared stories. And um, I have, since Jim went missing in Syria, I've been writing to him. Uh, now it's been uh, s several years. And um, to lighten the mood, the next slide is uh, the, the, you know, the inscription made by Jim. He gave me a copy of... 
uh, the unabridged letters of Sylvia Plath on Christmas uh, in 2006. And if you've seen his handwriting and you know the guy, um, this seems particularly apt. It says, DJ, fuck it, believe. No, no, uh, you know, no punctuation in there. <laughs> and uh, Jimmy 06. And you know, for a while, it's like, you know, it's, it's, you know, he's talking, you know, about faith. Uh, and I think, you know, on some level he is, but I think, he, you know, uh, writer to writer, he was spurring me on, giving a collection of uh, uh, class letters, uh, whom I really love. And uh, I'll read two short poems uh, from the collection in progress titled In the Absence of Sparrows. Details are nearly 20 years of friendship. And so the next poem is, Jim gave me a, a copy of uh, Federico Garcia Lorca's collected poems, a poet I came to love. It's coffee stained and battered at this point. Um, this past summer when I was in Spain, I made a pilgrimage to Granada to, uh, to, 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 to Lorca's summer home um, and learned at that time, uh, he was also executed uh, he, around August 19th by um, Franco's troops dragged um, out of this home. And you know, there are these parallels, um, these striking parallels. So uh, modeled after writer's song, a poem of Lorca's, I wrote a captive song. Aleppo crumbling in twilight, bound wrists, stone bed of a truck, olive trees ghosting past. I know I won't make Aleppo. Sear wind, hills beyond hills, red wrists, stone bed. A sniper keeps watch from Aleppo's heights. O oh, night like a tomb, O oh, my pale brothers who wait. Before I reach Aleppo, the moon will slice my throat. Aleppo, riven and starlit. And I'd like to thank uh, Stephen, uh, the Interdisciplinary uh, Institute uh, UMass Writing Program, um, for allowing us all to continue to tell Jim's story and stories. Uh, the author, uh, Jim Harrison, wrote, death steals everything except our stories. And Jim had thousands of stories uh, which we can continue to tell, and he helped so many other people tell their stories. Um, seems fitting to end with a poem uh, written in response to this image, uh, which uh, this is a photo of Jim in a U.S. Army bunker, bunker in Kunar Province, Afghanistan. And uh, if you know that book, you probably know. Does anyone know that, which book that is? Let the Great World Spin, uh, a book that I love. And um, nicely done. Uh, the, the, I think we have prizes in the back. Uh, we will, um, this poem includes uh, lines from Let the Great World Spin. If you haven't read it, I think it provides insight into Jim's life as well. With all respects to heaven, I like it here. Back propped against a mammoth wall of sandbags, your reading let the great world spin. Combat helmet cast off, aviator sunglasses set back on your head. I sit here thinking about how much courage it takes to live an ordinary life. Legs crossed, you're wearing the pants your mom bought you Christmas last. Your eyes gaze down at the page, lips slightly apart, a week's goatee sprouts. There is, I think, a fear of love. There is a fear of love. Minus the shelling in the distance, the flak jacket yoked around your neck. You could be reading in a cane chair at a cafe anywhere. Phoenix, Pilsen, Istanbul, Mexico City. The world spins, we stumble on, it is enough. Serene as it seems, images flit and ghost across the page. A gunner shot in the head on a mountain pass floats above Philippe Petit, now reclining on the wire, now upright. I was trying, really trying to pray to get rid of my lust, rediscover that innocence, circle of circles. You stole my books at times, I stole yours. <laughs> 50-50, you're reading a copy you filched from me. <laughs> no matter. We never said what we meant outright. We said instead, read this. you got to... <laughs> read this. you got to fucking read this. The world spins. We stumble on. It is enough. Thank you. So... Um, 
thank you very much for, for having us here and providing this venue. Um, we're very, we feel very fortunate um, to share some of these stories with you. Um, I'm, I'm going to read one poem and then I, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, social justice and what it means to us. Um, so uh, Jim and I um, used to listen to a lot of hip hop and that was kind of like one of our connections. Um, and so, uh, I mean, we saw Wu-Tang at Mullen Center when it, wasn't, when it was still the Mullen Center. So, you know, it was, uh, it was kind of like a point of intersection for us, um, not, not only with books, but with music. Uh, I was going to read something from here, um, but um, I'd like to not. And um, this is uh, something I wrote uh, when uh, we all knew Jim was, was being held captive and, and we had no idea what was going on. Um, so th this is a poem, it's called uh, Cypher Adagio. And uh, when, when uh, lyricists kind of do improv and they get into this thing where they're kind of going back and forth, it's, it's called a cypher. I know Jimmy is running through ciphers writing rhymes in the racquetball court of his mind and staying strong through stamina epistles. The writer factory done made us soft as pretzel gazelles and all that politicking turned my seersucker into a poncho. But hungry son, you've always had the moral torque of a Jesuit and this definitely won't be your last mission to the netherworld of deft fictionists. Hold on, familial horse. Keep you a regiment, adagio. Juggle supple invocations like an adjunct of Fortuna. I know Jimmy is looking for a word that rhymes with Kaiser, or mumbling rapid core syllables, lobbing foul ball phrases, and sprinkling Spanish and Arabic in the matrix. I know conditions might be inexorable for you, while we recycle the banter which makes us remember your off-the-dome, interstellar gramophone. You know the sound large calibers make as they darn Kevlar at 700 miles an hour. I know a Jeep bass mobile and resonant frequency turrets for to whisk you away from that pen of iniquity. You know the handsome punching bag of your face. Um, so <clears throat> the, the thing that I, I most want to say here and, and how I want to um, say thank you is um, I, I run an online journal that makes no money, but it makes me very happy. And Jimmy lent me $300 for the server space to kind of get that going. And, <clears throat> you know, he inspired me to kind of, you know, kind of dabble in, in print publications. And now <clears throat> that's kind of like another project in my life that I'm trying to get off the ground. But what I'm here to tell you, mostly I think, is please go into teaching. If you want to make a difference in the world, um, there's many ways to do it. There are Kabuls in this country. There are places where <clears throat> people live completely different from the way you live. And we have to stop ignoring that fact. We have to stop ignoring the fact that there are two Americas in our country, that there are two public education systems, and that there are two forms of life. We really need to, if we have any future in this country, we need to start addressing that with sincerity, with honesty, um, and even with, with questions. Um, so please, please go into teaching. Like we started here at the writing program, and uh, hey, what's up? How you, I know you. And, and it, was, it, it was phenomenal um, because it gave us an opportunity to really put our mouth where, where our money where our mouth is, right? And, and to really kind of believe the things that we said. Um, from there, um, Jim went to, well, Jim actually came here from TFA. And from here, I went to New York City Teaching Fellows, which is <clears throat> a phenomenal, I, I believe, organization that kind of puts you in the crappiest schools in New York and you figure out what's what, whether you're meant to teach or not. And I'll tell you right now, the reason I'm telling you to go into teaching is because it will break your heart every day. But that's the type of pain that will allow you to grow as a person, as a professional, and, and as a person who may not want to do teaching. For example, I'm a librarian right now, public librarian. So teaching helped me to understand how to put a program together. It taught me uh, how to understand the logistics behind curriculum 
It taught me to understand and gave me the vocabulary so that I know when people are being earnest and when they're just using their words for, for nothing. So, so please, um, please think about it. Um, you don't have to go far away. Go to Holyoke. Jim and I used to go to Care Center together. I used to use his car. He used to... That's right. <laughs> Thank you. But, but this, is, this is what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about is that it, it would have been very easy for us to just, you know, I taught for the Honors College. It was great. I taught for the writing program. That's great. That's beautiful. But there is no teaching, you know, like, like when, you know, you really kind of have to invest and you really have to ask yourself hard questions like, why am I not getting through? Um, and so, I, I please, I, I'm, I'm really begging you. Think about it. And, and, and one more thing. Um, they already have enough teachers at the really good private schools. Um, please think about um, teaching in the inner city. That's really where they need people who have an idea of what social justice is. That's really where they need people. They don't need them in the private schools. They don't need them in other places. And if you're scared of going to these schools, then that should tell you something about our America. That should tell you about the country we live in. And, and that fear is what's going to get you where you need to go. Um, please, um, I, I liked something that I think uh, Sabina said, and it's like, look under the rocks. Look under the rocks. There's, there's really rocks all over. You don't have to be a journalist to uncover the truth. I know a lot of teachers who have that role and who do that on a daily basis. And it's a thankless job, and it will break your heart, but it will also save you. Um, last thing. We have great ideas at this university about what education is and how to implement them. I'm telling you right now, if you go into the inner city, you will be allowed to innovate because the need is so high that they really don't care what you're teaching as long as you're teaching. The scrutiny is a lot less. The innovation is a lot more. And you can do things in the inner city with literature, history, politics, that you cannot do in the fee fi she she schools. They will not allow you. That's a technical term, by the way. <laughs> they will not allow you. They will stop you in your tracks if what you are trying to teach is not to their liking. So there are ways around this. There are ways to help people that do not involve going to Afghanistan, Iraq, or, an, or any other country, OK? We have those problems here. We need people here. Thank you very much. While Sagel sets up, there's about maybe uh, <laughs> 10 copies of this left. And we were going to sell them, but that's just such a bad idea. So please, um, on your way out, if there's some more, please, please take one. We'd really love it. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Um, I'm Sajel Shah, and um, I um, was a classmate of Jim's uh, and a friend of Jim's. And I just wanted to start with um, something that I saw our friend Aaron White write on Facebook. Um, this is uh, just writers like Jim write beyond themselves out and into the messy world. So writing workshops are oddly intimate spaces, even fiction workshops maybe especially fiction workshops. In stories, we re reveal aspects of ourselves, our histories, our interior lives, our sympathies, and most of all, the particular ways in which we observe and interpret the world. 
the ways in which we render both flaws and beauty. I was one of a handful of writers of color in a mostly white MFA program, and I often hated this aspect of graduate school and felt out of place. Being around Jim put me at ease. I admired his writing, its fearlessness, its humor. He was irreverent, funny, smart, well-read, observant, and serious. Jim, I didn't get to know you until January of 2000 when we were in John Weidman's fiction workshop. I knew no one in the class well, but it helped to have you there. We both wrote about race and class, about living between cultures. I remember your written comments, um, and I'll show you some, thoughtful but quirky, and this is how I first began to know you through your stories and your marginalia on mine. Yeah. So, uh, oh, here we go. So this is a story of mine um, with his handwriting on it, <clears throat> and it's called Dicot Monocot. You looked up words in my stories you didn't know, dicot, monocot, keloid, and jotted down the definitions next to the words themselves in your loping black scrawl. I was, I was teaching ninth grade a couple of years ago, and um, they, I had my students do annotations of their text, and they said, well, what do you want us to underline? Like, what, what do you want us to check? And I actually made copies of Jim's comments, because I had just come back from, from UMass and thinking about him. This was in um, September of 2014. And I said, look, he, he looked things up. Look at this. <laughs> Dicot, monocotyledon. He was looking this stuff up. <clears throat> Keloid. You wanted to know to be thorough. You misread my phrase keloid inch as keloid itch. We laughed about that. <laughs> we laughed about that later, our ongoing joke. You took time, you gave my stories, you gave everyone's stories, your attention, your eye. This is what all writers crave. Though I will know even in 2000 that you are one to take risks far greater than I am. I am secretly and deeply pleased when I read your workshop comments. I scour these stories and study your detailed thoughts, two pages long, on my not even three page story, and stop to reread a sentence after you signed your name, almost an afterthought. Now, I'll also say if you haven't been in any um, creative writing workshops or fiction workshops, that we write letters to each other. So the professor um, isn't reading them. So you can really blow it off, right? right? Yeah, I like that part, and I think you really need to work on this. So um, Jim took time. These are, this is um, the other story that I workshopped in 2000. So I love this. Question, who is assumed audience? White America? Why is it important to question the audience form of the story? And, and then here's, here are his comments to me. And uh, really, it's a map of your mind, what, what he was thinking as he read this, and how valuable it is to share that work is paying attention to what matters, and Jim paid attention. And I, um, so this last sentence meant a lot to me that he said, after he signed his name, I like the pathos, <laughs> nice word, right? I like the pathos you lay out there, you're, and uh, it's a run on. Your writing is risky, barbs underneath the fleecy texture. I just thought that was a beautiful one. I loved being called risky, and I always wore fleece. I was always cold, but just. <laughs> I am nearly giddy then to find your writing on these drafts to see, once again, in 2014, your handwriting, and especially how you sign your name. And we all often were just talking about how um, important his handwriting is to us, what you can see from handwriting. I find myself wishing you, addressed, you had addressed your comments, that you had also written my name so I could see my name in your handwriting. I am searching for evidence, for documentation, for ephemera. I realize that what I want is a letter. This one is to you. In the only picture I can find of you after I hear the news, Jim, you were at Food for Thought Books, a now defunct independent bookstore in Amherst. It was the spring of 2001. I had organized a Writers of Color reading in part to raise money for earthquake relief in India. And John Weidman was reading as part of that too. 
I'd planned the reading even before the earthquake hit. I wanted to create a space for writers of color to hear and celebrate each other's work and writing. You were introducing our friend Iago before he reads his poems. You were not a writer of color and weren't reading that night, and so I was surprised, taken aback at first when I discovered the photo with you up there at the podium, speaking, wearing a checked collared shirt. What were you doing there? Brian, that's your head, also. <laughs> then I remembered. Of course you would have been up there with us, not sitting back in the audience, but helping out, introducing Yago, showing up for our friends and cheering us on, present for the reading and stories and poems, there for the hanging out and the beers after and the beers during. Claro, every party, every reading was better with you there, Jim. You were a friend to everyone. There's no one else that I can say that of from our program. Most of us had our groups, our circles, even a nemesis or two. It was school, after all. And too many people who had dated each other, but you belonged to everyone, slipped effortlessly from one scene to another, from a place to a bar to a party thrown by international students in another department. You were welcome everywhere, anywhere. We never talked about it, but I want to tell you how much it meant to me that you spoke at that reading and came to my final MFA reading. I remember my hands shook, ice cold at both. Seeing your wide, easy smile and kind eyes bolstered me, calmed me, gave me faith that it would go all right, that everything would be fine. Jim showed up for people in his life and supported us, whatever it was we were doing or wanted to be doing. Whenever around him, I felt seen and accepted. He really looked at you. Jim had the gift of making everyone in his presence feel good about themselves, no matter who they were, and no matter how awkward or unhappy they may have felt. Everything I know, everything I knew, everything I know about Jim reminds me to be kinder, to show up, to live. I'm grateful for the reminder. I'm going, to, I'm going to read a slightly shortened version of an essay that I wrote about missing Jim and looking for him in the months after his death. One morning, two Septembers ago, I stood in a fallow field trying to pray the rosary. I say trying because it had been 15 years since I last prayed the rosary, so now I fumbled with the beads lost track of the prayers as crickets bumped against my legs and wild turkeys watched from the field's wooded edge. I was crying while I prayed and laughing when I had to rummage for my notes, dropping beads in the dirt. I first learned to pray the rosary when I was 24 and converted to Catholicism. I was a striver. I memorized the prayers and recited them each morning. But soon after my conversion, I fell in love with a woman and I relinquished the church. Later, when my three-year-old daughter found my rosary beads in a drawer and asked if she could have them, I told her she could. But then Jim was killed, and I needed my rosary beads again. People were surprised to learn I knew Jim. Were you close, they asked skeptically. I don't blame them. I live in rural Massachusetts. I volunteer in the school garden. It seems unlikely that the first American executed by the so-called Islamic State would be my friend. But I said yes, we were close. I met Jim in 2000 when we were both 27 years old. After a few shared workshops, he and his friends asked me to be in their writing group. They were a year ahead of me in school, so their invitation was both flattering and intimidating. What if they didn't like my story? What if they didn't like me? At our first meeting, Jim drank my beer because I was too nervous to drink, and Shauna pushed her plate of fries across the table to me. They let me in on their running jokes. They praised my story. Later, when we were walking to our cars, Jim said, it was cool having you, and he put up his hand for a high five closed his fingers around mine, pulled me toward him for a moment. 
I felt the joy of belonging. These four were the friends I'd been looking for because they were gifted and gracious writers and because they were Catholics living somewhere in the land between practicing and lapsed. They were natives in a world I still longed to enter, and while this sometimes made me jealous, it also made them all the easier to love. Jim went on to journalism school and conflict reporting. I had a baby and then another. And when that second baby turned two, Jim was taken captive in Libya. After his release, I wanted him to stay home. Why not get a desk job, meet a nice girl, file stories about climate change, campaign finance reform? I didn't actually say these things to Jim. I cried with relief, but I didn't call him. He seemed to have millions of friends now, all over the world. His life was big, while mine felt both overwhelming and mundane. My world was children and marriage and the writing I wasn't getting done. I didn't know what any of that could mean to Jim. I was on vacation when I got the news of Jim's death, and it was Shauna who called. It's Jimmy, she said in a message, don't go on the internet. For a few days, I followed Shauna's advice, but soon enough, I was staying up late, searching the internet for pictures of Jim. Not the ones from the last minutes of his life, I still haven't seen those, but images of Jim in Afghanistan and Libya, Chicago and New York. As I opened window after window, I burned with embarrassment. Who was I to grieve James Foley, to mourn the death of this handsome war correspondent in a helmet and a flak jacket, the one eulogized by world-famous journalists, by the president and the pope? With every picture, Jim moved further from me, and I knew him less. Had my Jim, the young man who knew nothing of the horrors to come, ever existed? Even his name began to cleave from him. How strange, I thought, when I saw it in print. I once had a friend with that name. One night I found an interview in which Jim said he'd prayed the rosary every day of his captivity in Libya, keeping track of the prayers on his knuckles because he didn't have beads. He knew his mother and grandmother would also be praying the rosary, and he wanted to find them in those prayers. I got up from the computer and went into my sleeping daughter's room to find my rosary beads. I pulled the beads through my fingers, trying to remember the prayers. I couldn't recall even one. I felt like an imposter. I started down the hall to put them back, but stopped. I had lost many chances to reach Jim, and what if this was my last? I went to the computer and Googled praying the rosary. <laughs> it takes a while to pray the rosary, which is how I ended up in that field on that September morning. I didn't want to be interrupted. I didn't want anyone to know what I was doing, considering I didn't know what I was doing. I fumbled and wept my way through the first prayers, but after the 10 Hail Marys and the first mystery, I wasn't crying and I was moving fast. I was on to the second mystery and the third, and the Hail Marys between, paced like heartbeats so you can speed up and not get lost. My fingers moved from one bead to the next, and the prayers tumbled out until I heard myself say, oh, Jim, and I stopped praying. I held the bead still in my hand, Jim. Just like that, it was his name again. I saw his face then, and it was not the face of photographs. It was my Jim, the young man who was driven and restless, but did not contain the dark future. He was entirely himself. He was having a wonderful time, and I was lucky to be having it with him. Here's the strange thing. After I said Jim's name, after I saw his face, the sky changed. It became a breathing thing, tipping from one horizon to another. It was Jim. I watched the clouds move as the air filled with his kind sturdiness. I wanted to stay with him all day until the stars emerged. But Jim was close now, and I could hear him laugh at the idea, close enough that I could feel him sending me back down the hill. I believe in new things since I began to pray the rosary again on that September morning two years ago. I believe in the return of old friends and in the lasting freedom of death. I believe that Jim came to me in the field and that he waits there for me still. Thank you.
Hi, um, my name is Tom Durkin. Um, I'm in from Milwaukee, and I just want to thank everyone that was involved with putting this together. This is an amazing event for a, a, a really worthy cause and for a great person. Um, so I, I'm truly honored to be part of this. Um, I'm very fortunate. I, I met Jim in 1992, first week as a freshman at Marquette. And one of the things that Charlie Senate had mentioned was talking about these tribes that Jim was part of. And I, I was very lucky um, in a number of ways. One, I was lucky that when we were graduating college, Jim and I made a pact. Unlike Daniels, our pact was not to go to law school, despite the fact that we took the LSAT. So I, I gave up any chance of being financially successful to follow Jim's, uh, and my dream to, what he referred to as, we're not becoming bloodsuckers. And so our, we, our goal was, was to do that. And we, we became professional students, uh, MAs, PhDs, MFAs, MAs, and uh, I would say amateur teachers. We, we, we had teaching gigs, some we shared, we both taught at the boot camp, things like that. But it was, I think we were, we were both students, and I, I learned a lot from him as a student of the world, I believe. He was, uh, like, I, I was thinking about when people were asking him earlier about becoming, like, a really good journalist, or how about a writer or a teacher. The, in my opinion, his number one skill was his listening ability. That guy listened better than anybody and can get you to share and open up and push you in ways, so people that are going into journalism, people that are going into teaching, people that want to be a good writer, of which Jim was all three of these things, I think it springs from his ability to listen. He, he, he understood people and he wanted to understand people. Um, so I, I, I just feel fortunate that I got to, like, these people here, I, Heather McDonald, I've slept on her couch, the Foley's house, I stayed, I stayed at the Foley house. Yago kicked me out of his place in New York City. Daniel, I, I've, stayed with, I, I've stayed with him. I, I got to meet all these amazing people because I hitched my star with Jim, and he was a listener who, who took chances, met people, listened to people. And it, it's been a great adventure, and in some ways this adventure is continuing because of the tremendous work he's done that people are responding to, and it keeps his story going, and I think it's important. And I also have a selfish side where it's my friend and I feel sometimes I'm like I don't want everybody to know him. I don't want them to know them how they know him. Um, I think that that makes a documentary important but it also at times makes me feel selfish because I, I want to pull it back and, and hold on to it. So one of the things I did for that I, I'm gonna read a short piece. I'm not a writer. I teach literature so I'm near it but I don't write. But Yago, my current friend but now former editor, Inspired me, uh, inspired me to write a puzzle, which you will not find in your copy. So everyone here, you um, you are getting a bonus reading. This is it is not in there. It's the it's the 29th puzzle. Um, so um, I'm going to read this and uh, I'll keep it brief. But thank you, former editor. I, I do feel like a real writer. I've got my rejection letter to put on the wall. Um, <laughs> so here, here here we go. This is for Jimmy. Come on, Tommy, your common refrain, but also my marching orders every time. Come on, Tommy. Come on, Tommy, Tommy, Tommy. I had no choice but to follow. Flew to UMass. You picked me up and then promptly ran, ran out of gas on the way to teach ESL. <laughs> we crashed at Heather's, scoured New York City for food, drink, and desperation. How happy I was to follow. Puerto Penasco. Pescaderias, cervezas, an American who knew where to get the good stuff. My pops, my pops offered you a Chicago gig at the boot camp. This time it was you who would follow. Manhattan for DJ's wedding, you ducked into the subway with a girl, laughing, as I pleaded with you to be honest. You pawned me off on Iago, but Jimmy, I couldn't fault your charm. It was not a time to follow. My best man, a toast to Barbara and me, Delaney's godfather, these things never happened. Journalists can't choose when a story will break. You had a passion you had to follow. You always told me I was a writer. I would laugh and say, no, Jimmy, I'm just a reader. I let you down. I didn't write enough. I wanted to believe you, but your advice I didn't follow. Libya, my heart ached, but I knew you would be back. Friends cinched together. You returned. We worked on a novella about your captivity. It was your story people wanted to follow. Syria, 
chaos, al-Nusra, al-Qaeda, ISIL, ISIS. Hope stretched thin, but I knew you were alive. I feared you were too brave, too resilient, too proud. I know why prisoners chose you to follow. You escaped. Did you taste freedom for a brief moment? Feel the sunshine on your face? You surrendered because your fellow captive, your friend, was unable to follow. Pictures of you liven up our home, triumphant after Libya, holding Delaney, you and me, collages, 20 plus years of memories. We leave a light on in the hope you will follow. I need to hear that belly, belly laugh, the one that doubled you over, making me laugh along with you. One more, come on, Tommy. Jimmy, my brother, I'm lost without you to follow. I don't have much to say. I, I just want to thank all of you, every one of you here. You've all, um, John and I have come to know our son really through so many of you uh, since he died. He was our oldest son, always away, always um, present when home, wanting to hear our story, where we were, how we were, but rarely sharing much of what he was about and what he was doing. So all of you helped me um, help bring Jim alive, really, um, and make me proud and so grateful. And that is partly why we felt the need to start the foundation, because Jim was passionate about life. He had so much he wanted to do. And he, um, I really think he would have returned to education because he loved teaching um, nearly as much as he loved being a journalist. It was, he just loved life, you know, and he was uh, very interested in people. So um, part of what we've tried to do in the foundation is to continue some of Jim's passion about press freedom, about freedom in general, um, and just an awareness of a lot of the uh, problems in the world, if you will. And the desire, Jim was a unifying presence. Um, John and I reflect on in our family, as well as among friends, that Jim liked all kinds of people. You know, um, he was as at ease with his university professor as he was at someone at the um, child care center. Um, he thoroughly enjoyed um, his students um, everywhere he was in just different ways. He was interested. And uh, so I, I just, um, I've, now I lost my train of thought. Anyway, guys, I just thank you. I thank you for the opportunity. I thank you, Mass, for remembering Jim. And I pray that all of you will be a bit inspired by Jim's um, hopefulness. He would have wanted us to make a difference. This world needs us. This world needs us to um, do what it can to shine a light on the issues in the world. There's much work to be done. And he challenges me continually. And I hope that his life can challenge you. I think my husband has something he wants to say. So I thank you. <laughs> I um, really want to say that um, Jim is so proud of all of you. Um, you made his life what it was. You, you helped him, you gave him the joy in each and every minute that he spent with you. You challenged him to do all the great things that he was able to do. And you challenge yourselves to continue. Um, Diane and I have lost Jimmy. We have gained so much, so much. In the two years since Jim's death, we have been held up by all of the friends of Jim, all the people we've met, all the people who wanted to help. They held us by the shoulders, the arms. They've helped us walk. The foundation 
was Diane's child, but it has been given birth to by everyone. We, we feel part of a community that has Jim's stamp and your love. So we, we um, feel all of you are part of our family. You'll always be part of Jim's family. Um, <laughs> these people are all special. Jim would never come home alone. If you invited Jimmy to come, he would always come. He was always late. And he never came alone. Um, and to Jim's credit, you're all here. And to your credit, you're all here. We all could see the good in Jim, but Jim could see the good in all of you. He didn't hang around with idiots. He didn't waste time. He didn't have time to, to um, be superficial. He was open, he was honest, and he was loving. And if you knew Jim, he wanted to know you. So thank you so much. Um, this is Stephen Klingman again. I just want to thank everybody on this panel uh, for speaking today, uh, for your extraordinarily moving words. Uh, it's very special for us to have you here, uh, our former students who, you know, we think uh, very warmly towards, no matter what you think we think of you, we, 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 we genuinely, uh, you know, our lives depend on you where uh, our lives are connected with you. And it's just wonderful to have you back. And you all spoke so movingly, and to Diane and John Foley as well for their words, just very, very special. Uh, I'll have a few more words to say about that in a few minutes. We're going to take a five-minute break, and then we're going to have two very special events. Martina Spada reading from uh, Jim Foley's MFA thesis. Wonderful reading, I can assure you. And uh, Charlie Sennett will be giving some words of remembrance about, uh, about James Foley. And I'll say a few words in conclusion and we'll be done. But just a five-minute turnover, breath of air, stretch uh, for the last stretch. And uh, thanks again to everybody who spoke on this. Thanks to Noi uh, for, for running this session as well. Thank you.